Welcome, everybody. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're just here chitter-chattering, and I'm sorry that uh, we're a little bit late coming on, but that's uh, uh, sometimes on Sunday night, that's the way things are, yeah. So everybody out there in, in uh, uh, coffin land and sinus land and all the other kind of lands where everybody is and stuff like that, I, I know how you feel. I felt that way last week, so praise the Lord. Hey, you finally, finally let me go. But uh, it's good to see you guys here with us tonight. Such a faithful group we have here at our church. They uh, come to everything. <laughs> Thank the Lord, or I'd be here by myself, wouldn't I? Yeah, I'm telling you. And we're, uh, we're looking in, uh, in, in chapter, we're going to try to do two chapters tonight. And, and I'm trying to kind of move us on along because we kind of come to the point in the book of Revelation where we're moving um, into the into the into the last section, and by the last section, I mean um, that you, you're you, you get past uh, these intermissions, where in the intermissions you have information being given to you that uh, the Spirit wants you to know about what's going on in heaven or what's happening behind the scenes while certain things are happening on earth. And uh, if you look at your outline, by the way, let me just mention to those of you that might be watching us uh, online, if you'd like to, I, I hand out outlines um, in every one of these teachings, and I put on there the things that I think, you know, you might want to know that I might not say, or if I don't say it, it's written down for you so that you can look at it and see some of the important things that, that I, if I was taking, what I, what I really try to do is I try to write these notes as if, I was taking notes. If I was sitting here listening and I was taking notes, this is what I would write down. So anyway, hopefully that's helpful. And if you, if you guys want it um, that are watching online, if you'll just go on Facebook and send us a message or, you know, you can go to our website, which is freedomriverchurch.org, and you can, um, you can send us a message there, you know, contact us, and you can send a message, and we'll send you these, you know, we'll send you a file with all these in them, and, uh, and you, can, you can have all of them uh, all the way through. Uh, matter of fact, I'm, I'm all the way with notes through chapter 18. So, yeah, yeah, Mystery Babylon and all of that kind of stuff. It's a lot of, <laughs> there, there are a lot of fireworks ahead is all I'm going to tell you, you know. And, uh, and, and, and really, even tonight, you kind of start seeing the countdown moving toward um, the conclusion of some things and moving toward uh, Jesus coming back for the second time. Uh, and I, I've talked to you all about that before. And I know a lot of times when you, when you talk about the return of Christ, uh, people really have a term that they use. They call it the second coming. Well, some people by the second coming mean the rapture, when Jesus returns to take us home. The first coming be, being his coming to Jerusalem, I mean to Bethlehem as a baby, and then the second coming being when he comes in the clouds and then we're called off this earth to meet him in the clouds, and that's what we call the rapture. And, and then uh, that's what they call the second coming. But, but, but that's not, technically, that's not the second coming because he technically doesn't come back to the earth. In the rapture, we go up to meet him. Uh, so, so it's the rapture. The second coming is when he actually puts his foot back down on earth again, which happens at the end of the tribulation period. Or the, that's what I believe, and I know there are different beliefs about that. Some people believe it's the middle of tribulation, some at the, at the beginning. Some believe it's already happened, you know, because uh, the book of Revelation is written about the fall of Jerusalem when Rome took it over and the temple and all of that, and that's just a whole bunch of explanation. But, but the point being that um, he does come back and put his foot on earth again, and that's technically the second coming. When, and then he, he, he fights the Battle of Armageddon, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, it's really not much of a fight, actually. You know, <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's actually, uh, he just comes in and, and destroys the kingdoms that are um, marshaled against tiny little Israel and the kingdom of the Antichrist and all of that kind of stuff. It's really kind of an interesting issue that's going on there. And when we, when we get there, we'll, we'll look at it. Uh, it. It's really more like a campaign more than a battle. And as a matter of fact, the word that's used in the scripture uh, for the battle of Armageddon 
really the translation of that word battle could, could more likely be a campaign or like a war. In other words, implying that there's more than one battle, one, more than one fight that goes on within a little cluster there of what really happens at Armageddon because it's, 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 uh, there's a little bit more to it than just one, one little time and, and everybody's taken care of all at the same time, it, it, you know, and we'll talk about that when we get there, but it's, but it's really good. But, but then that's the second coming of Christ, and then he's going to come a third time when he establishes a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem and all that. So anyway, uh, just kind of throw some monkey wrenches in our thinking about, about that. But anyway, we don't want to get too technical about it. But, but this, where we are now in chapter 14 and chapter 15 is we're headed toward the return of Christ when, um, when he comes to set up his millennial kingdom. But before we get to that, we've got to have some events that happen in these two chapters and, uh, and then some big things that happen in chapter 16 and 17 and 18 where the kingdom of the Antichrist is brought to its knees and mystery Babylon is vanquished and all of that kind of stuff. So um, let's, just, let's just begin reading. Um, let, let, me, let me mention this. I wrote it on the notes, and, and we'll start with this, and then we'll just read chapter 14 and 15 and try to walk through that. Uh, there, in in the book of Revelation, there are uh, there are are eight signs that are mentioned in the scripture uh, that happen during this little intermission that we're in right now, and these eight signs are intended to be um, like um, like like a like an like an awesome picture. And it, car- it, it carries the action through this little intermission of time. And the only reason I mention this is because in the passage we're going to read, it'll say, uh, and he showed them a sign. And then, and then it'll, it'll mention uh, a, a picture of something. And then and, and another sign he gave them, and then a picture of something, and another sign. And, and he wants us to see how the action moves, and he wants us to see some pictures of things that represent... Uh, spiritual issues so that it can help us stay on track on, on what all this is about. So I wrote them in your notes, and let, let me just mention them so that we can kind of get in the flow before we start reading these passages of Scripture. Um, and I wrote them in your notes. The first picture is in chapter 12, and it's the woman, and, and the woman is Israel, and she's protected by God. You remember the dragon is flying around and he's trying to, he, trying to kill the child that she's trying to birth. Well, that's one of the pictures. The picture is of a woman and the woman is Israel. The second picture, uh, Satan makes his entrance by, uh, by being engaged in a war that's in heaven with Michael and he gets, of course, thrown out of heaven and thrown down to the earth and, and so forth. The third picture is uh, Satan is uh, enraged with the woman, Israel, and, and the woman has to flee into the wilderness. The fourth picture, uh, Satan introduces his plan to, um, uh, to fight against God by introducing the beast, which is the Antichrist. And then the fifth picture is the false prophet that uh, tries to lead in worship against the Antichrist. The sixth picture happens in chapter 14, and it's the picture of Jesus standing in victory with 144,000 saints of God that have been sealed during the, during the tribulation to preach the gospel. And then um, the seventh picture is in chapter 14 at the end, and it's when God begins to um, pour out his judgment on the earth. And then the eighth picture, by the way, there's only there's eight of them, and it's in chapter it's in chapter 15, and it's when God begins to pour out these plagues on earth. So, in other words, these pictures just kind of give you a little chronology of what's happening. The woman Israel, God protects her. Satan begins to try to fight against her. She has to flee. Uh, the Antichrist comes in. The Beast comes in, and then um, and and God. Uh, protects Israel. 
Israel, he's standing in victory with 144,000 of, of his uh, sealed believers, and then uh, he begins to pour out judgment on the earth. So that just kind of gives you the flow of what's happening here. And all of these events that he's talking about in chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15, none of those things are happening while in the middle of tribulation, even though that's where we are. We're in the, the first three and a half years has gone by where the beast has tried to be friends with Israel and tried to convince Israel that he's, gonna, he's for her and that he's going to protect her and he's going to be her man and she can trust him and all of that kind of stuff, uh, just trying to win her confidence. And then the last three and a half years of tribulation uh, is when he comes into the temple, he sets up the abomination of desolation on the sacrificial altar. Israel recognizes, oh no, he's turned against us. We better run for our lives. And for the last three and a half years of tribulation called Great Tribulation, he chases Israel. He chases the Jewish people. He persecutes uh, anybody who believes in Christ, kills them, tortures them. Uh, they run for their lives. Uh, any Jewish person is a uh, prime target, and they have to be protected by, by the Gentiles of the world and that God is prepared to protect them, and they have to be hidden and kept safe, or else none of them would be alive when Jesus comes back because he'd kill every one of them. And, um, and, and so uh, the events that we're reading about don't actually happen right in the middle. It, these events are happening at the beginning, some of them, and at the end, some of them. But they're being talked about in the middle because God is kind of letting us see behind the scenes. So like I said last week, I think, this is kind of the idea of these middle chapters here that we're in is meanwhile back at the ranch. You know, okay, we see what's happening in the in the movement of things, but meanwhile, back at the ranch, and then it kind of takes you inside and shows you some things that are going on in the heavens. And so, let, let's just begin reading here in the first verse of chapter uh, of chapter fourteen. And uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And because of that, because of that, he's going through all of this. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. He told somebody to do something and they didn't do it. <laughs> and because of that, he's going through this. Where the Jews got to run for their lives. Mm -hmm. Forever. Because God said to kill everything. Mm -hmm. so he didn't do it. Yeah. Yeah, what Lawrence is talking about, and I'm, I'll say this for people that may not be able to hear what he's saying. Uh, he's talking about uh, when God commanded Saul to go out and take care of, uh, kill everything, animals, uh, people, whatever, don't leave anything alive, and uh, he didn't do it. And he brought back Agag, the king, and we've talked about that before, and all the cattle. And Samuel asked him, did you do everything God said do? And he said, I did everything God said do. And he said, well, what is the bleeding of these sheep that I hear and the sound, lowing of the cattle and all that kind of stuff? And uh, they didn't do it. So anyway, here we are with uh, Israel being uh, uh, dog. chastised, dogged, yeah, dog. by all of it. All right, now here, here we go, chapter 1, uh, chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 having his father's name written on their foreheads. Now, what this is is a picture. It's a, it's a forward look. Uh, verse 1 is, does not happen in the middle of the tribulation. Verse 1 happens at the end of the tribulation. And what this is is a picture, a foreview of the fact that when Jesus comes and to rescue Israel at the end of the tribulation period, that standing with him is going to be the 144,000 Jews that have been sealed by God 
to preach the gospel during the tribulation period. You remember back in chapter, uh, what was it, chapter uh, uh, 6 or so, 6, 7, right in there? Uh, before before a, an event happened, he had to he sealed 144,000 with the seal of God, and they couldn't be touched by the Antichrist because they had the seal of God. Well, back then he, we didn't have any idea what the seal of God is, but now, according to verse one, it says that the seal of God was that they had their father's name written on their foreheads. Now whether it was Yahweh, you know, which is uh, I am, uh, which is what God said his name was when Moses says, well, uh, who shall I say sent me? And God said, you tell them I am has sent you. So the only time God has ever told us what his name is, he said, my name is I am. And that was, uh, matter of fact, the Jews wrote it so that it couldn't even be pronounced because it was so sacred that they didn't want anybody to say it. So they wrote it without consonants, and it was Y-H-W-H. And that's what it was forever until um, we came along and translated the Scripture, and it became translated into Latin, and then it became translated into English. And, of course, for us, as, as believers, we wanted to say God's name, and it wasn't too holy to pronounce. And so we just put a couple of vowels in. And, and so we don't really know for sure that Yah... We put an A-Y-A-H... Uh, wait a minute. You see, Y-A-H-W-E-H is what we turned it into, Yahweh, which means the great I Am. So that might be what's written across there. Of course, it could be any, could be Jehovah, it could be Elohim, you know, it could, could be any of the holy names of God. Jehovah's the covenant name of God. All of those Jehovah names are the God who makes a covenant with us. Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah uh, Nisan, um, you know, Jehovah Shalom. There are nine Jehovah names of God. But whatever it is, the name of God is written on their forehead, and that is what seals them. And so in verse 1, it says, all right, what I saw, this sign that I saw, was I saw uh, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and Mount Zion is the mountain where the temple of God was built and the temple of God was in Jerusalem. It's the holy mountain of God. And standing on Mount Zion, now remember this is a picture of Jesus. This is a picture of what's going to happen when Jesus stands at the end of tribulation, when he, makes, when he judges the Antichrist and he defeats the Antichrist. Then you're going to see Jesus. John says, all right, here's what I saw, and this is a sign for you. I'm gonna, I saw Jesus standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000 who have been sealed to preach the gospel standing on the mountain with him. And they were sealed with the Father's name on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. Now, what he's describing here is he's describing like this cosmic orchestra. Because what they're tuning up to play with, 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 these, uh, with this rushing water and this rumbling thunder and this chorus of harps, uh, they're kind of like a soundtrack. And, they're, and, and, and that, begins to, that sound begins to, to go on around these 144,000 Jewish uh, guys that have been sealed. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who re were redeemed from the earth. So here's what John is saying now. At the end of the tribulation period, when Jesus comes back and steps his foot down on the mountain, the mountain's going to split, Mount Zion, and he's going to be standing on Mount Zion, and we're going to see, and, the, and, the, and all the Jews are going to see him, and there are going to be 144,000 the ones that have been sealed with God's name on their forehead are going to be standing there with him, and they're going to start singing a song. 
And the song that they're singing is a song that no one else can sing but them. You know, sometimes when you go through certain things, nobody else can really understand what you've been through. And nobody can talk about it because they don't know what it's like because they haven't been through it. And so here they are. And John said, thunder's going to start thundering behind them, and a rushing wind is going to sound behind them, and harps are going to be playing behind them. So like this cosmic orchestra playing, these guys are going to begin to sing a song that nobody can sing but them because nobody's experienced what they've experienced but them. And so they, were, they began to sing them on the earth. And these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. That's kind of really an interesting concept there. Um, it, 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 because God says that, because he says, it's really important that you know that these guys are virgins and these guys have not been defiled with women. You're wondering, okay, God, why would that be, why would that be so important? Well, you have to remember that what he's talking about is the virtuous nature of these 144,000, that they have not participated in the uh, religious activities and practices of the day. Because one of the things that are going to mark uh, the, the, the religion of the Antichrist is this um, lascivious lifestyle. I mean... Uh, um, you know, all of, the, all of the cults of the Babylonians and the Romans and the Syrians and, you know, the, uh, when Paul established a church in Corinth and, you know, you had these uh, temple prostitutes and you had these religions that are based around uh, uh, a, a lustful lifestyle. Yeah, a lustful lifestyle. And, and temple prostitutes are part of the worship service. And and lust and those kind of things are, are not only not condemned, they're applauded by these, these religions. They're part of the service, part of the practice of these things. And so in contrast to the, uh, the religion of the beast and the religion of the day that practice these kind of, this kind of lascivious, lustful, um, sexual, open lifestyle, these guys are in contrast to that. And he says, look, just so you'll know, these guys are going to be marked by the fact that they were, didn't participate in that kind of stuff at all because they're virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were pure. as Right. That's exactly right. That these guys are pure and that they're undefiled and that they are distinctly marked from everybody that's around them. And they follow the lamb. Now, and it's kind of interesting. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. And these, are, these were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the lamb. Now, that little phrase, and he follows them wherever they go. Yeah, Bill? Right now, I just realized, you know, you hear people think, people think that when we were times, Right. Right. This right here just shoots all of that. Oh, yeah. Because these people are the only ones that never sinned or they're mm -hmm. pure. That's exactly and right. All of us have been redeemed. Right. And saved, so we're going to be there too. Yeah, exactly. So Right, and these are not these are not a hundred and forty four thousand of us kind of people. Really, is what I yeah. It's no no doubt. Yeah, right, right. Because these guys have been sealed by God and they've never participated. Yeah, Rick. I don't know if anybody has never sinned that Jesus died for nothing. Right. Right. Then, then right. I, I thought everybody well, yeah, uh, and this is and this is not really this. Yeah, this is not talking about necessarily somebody who's never sinned. It's somebody who has been uh, removed from that kind of lifestyle. I mean, they're obviously they're going to be grown men saved are sealed by God when they're called because they're going to be 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. <laughs> So you're, you're thinking that they're adult human beings, of course. They've had pride, and they've had uh, rebellion, and they've had disobedience in their life. 
but they're still so they're still sinners but they've been redeemed by God and they and they've never participated in this lascivious lifestyle that has uh, marked everybody else oh yeah they're well I mean yeah for f f yeah because the Bible says for all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God and so it, it's not that they're sinlessly perfect it's that they're not they're, they're even though they're they're sinful, they're not held accountable because they've been redeemed by God by having his name written, just like we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I mean, we, so yeah. They were sealed, but I mean, they don't sin right, that's exactly right. Yeah, that is exactly right. Yeah, from the time that, yeah, from the time that they're sealed, they have God's name, and they become God's instrument, and they're not, sin, they're not sinful anymore. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, and, and, and that's exactly right. I mean, we, right, that's exactly right. And, uh, and they become, once they've been sealed, then they are taken out of the lifestyle of the world, and they're sealed by God. And notice it says, and they follow him where, wherever he goes, which means that wherever Christ wants them to go, that's where they go. It's like you need somebody to... Uh, challenge the beast when he stands up to give his message, hey, we're there. Just send us. You know, you need somebody to go into his temple and, uh, and grab, the, grab that sacrifice off the altar and throw it on the floor, hey, we're your man. You know, <laughs> come on, we'll do it. Uh, you need to, somebody to crash the banquet that he's having so he can get crowned as the king, hey, just we're your man. Come on, we'll go wherever you want us to go. And so this is, uh, this is the way they're described, that they're those that go wherever the lamb, the lamb, wherever he goes, and these were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the lamb. Yeah, yeah. That's how my grandparents did, pretty much, that I remember. You know, up, we wake up in the morning, God told us, and we prayed over it, and next, you know, we packed up, and we hid here, or going there, or, you know, and that's how it's Right. Yep, they follow they follow the Lord wherever they go. Right. 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 So you've been led a lot by people who say the Lord said the Lord this, said. and the Lord led me to do this. <laughs> I know it was right. Yeah. But, uh, the Lord said. Mm -hmm. And and here you are, eleven years later. No, what? Thirteen years later. Fourteen years later. Fourteen years later, you're here because the Lord said. And see that? I mean, and that's an example. And Bill and Pat, you same way, you know. And Rick, Patty, I'm not exactly sure exactly what brought you from from what Indiana was it? Uh, Ohio, close, <laughs> close, but Ohio down here, and uh, but uh, I'm sure it had something to do. Did did you feel like the Lord wanted you to come to the to Mississippi, or was it just something that brought you here? The mainly the weather. Okay, I got you. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, right. Well, hey, there you go. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and, it's, and, and that's fine. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But in contrast, I mean, as an example, I know Billy and Pat are here because God told them to be here. I mean, I, I know it because I know them personally, and I know Bev and Lawrence the same way because I know them personally, and I know what brought them here to Mississippi. And I know, like with Lawrence and Bev, it was almost like anywhere but Mississippi, you know, because of, of the reputation and all of that kind of stuff but because they felt God said that. And they had no one here. I mean, they had, I mean, Billy and Pat did. They had us, and they already knew us, and this is where they really wanted to be because they felt like this is where the Lord wanted them to be. But with Lawrence and Bev, they didn't know us at all. They had, no, they didn't, they, they didn't know us at all. And it was only when the Lord uh, said something that, uh, that, that they recognized where they were. What, Pam? Okay, from the gallery. <laughs> from the gallery. Yeah. Yeah. Why 
Right, right. Or else to reside in. Right. What neighborhood? <laughs> That's right. And he does. He does, and and for you, for you guys that are, uh, let me let me mention this to them, because they'll be sitting there. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, coincidences is God's way of of remaining anonymous, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Uh, for those that that were not part of all that, I, I know uh, we talk about things here, and they're the only thing they're hearing is what's going through this little mic right here, and it's not going to be picking you guys up. And uh, so let me, I'm just mentioning this so that they'll kind of know, because I think they they need to hear what we're saying, because it's really evidence of. But anyway, the the point was, Pastor Tanya from the from back there in the back uh, said uh, that God will let you believe what you need to believe in order to obey Him, and I think a lot of times that's true because. Um, you you need to believe that what he says to you is possible or that that's what he wants you to do and lots of times he doesn't he doesn't tell you all the details about that because that might be a little bit of a discouragement so uh, with 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 Rick and Patty coming down here was a was a fact of weather okay we live up in Ohio it's cold we don't want to be cold anymore let's go down south and so the fact that they wanted to escape the cold was what they needed to, for God to have them have a desire for so he could then control the circumstances of their life in order to move them where he moved them. Why out of all the places in the world would they buy a house in Mississippi in the community, Gulfport, Mississippi, on the block where they live, and this is the unusual thing, and they live right across the street from a neighbor who said, where you need to go is Freedom River Church, and that neighbor doesn't even go to our church. And, you know, it's like, I have no idea. You know, uh, uh, they said, hey, you need to go to Freedom River Church, and so <laughs> that's right. Their, their neighbor said, hey, I don't know. And, um, and then here they are, and now they're, right, they're here with us because that's where God wanted. And, of course, Bell and Lawrence, came down from Chicago, and uh, the Lord said, go to Mississippi, and, uh, and they probably said, what? Anywhere but Mississippi. Lawrence, Lawrence, yeah, <laughs> Lawrence spent his life dodging Mississippi, as a matter of fact. Yeah. So the way that God leads us, and, and what this is saying is that God led these 144,000, and wherever he led them, they went exactly where they wanted him to go. So we're seeing a picture of right there, at the end of tribulation when Jesus is standing there on the mount and everything has been, uh, Israel has been rescued and he's getting about to start the kingdom, about the, thou the thousand year millennial kingdom. Here with him are standing these 144,000 Jewish people who have been sealed with the name of God in their forehead. And these are the ones that have, uh, have been led by God and they've not been defiled by the religion of the world or the religion of the Antichrist, but, and they've been separated out for the kingdom of God and they're the, the, cosmic, uh, the cosmic orchestra starting to tune up behind them and harps are playing and the thunder's thundering and the wind is rushing and they're kind of warming up and beginning to get ready to sing a song that nobody can sing but them because nobody's experienced God like they've experienced God because they're the people that have gone wherever Christ wanted to go and they are the first fruits these are redeemed from among men being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. Now, first fruits is a reference to one of the feast days of Israel, the holy days of Israel. And the holy days, the Jewish, the Jewish people are the only people on earth that God has established their holy days, their holidays. That's what, what holiday comes from. God said, all right, there are going to be seven holy days that Israel is to observe. In other words, God said, all right, Israel, uh, Hebrews, here are your special days. This is in the book of Leviticus, by the way, about chapter 23 or so. He said, all right, you're going to have seven holy days. And he started telling them what they were. And the first one was Passover. Their holy days begin with Passover. Now, not, not to get too technical about everything, but just so you'll know, um, Passover, the first three holy days happen in the first month of the year, the religious year. 
And the religious year starts with the month of Nisan. Nisan is around uh, March, April in our days. Because remember, the Jewish calendar is not solar like ours. It doesn't have 12 months in the year. It, it ha it is a, it's, it's based on the moon, so every month has 28 days instead of 28 days, 30 days, or 31 days. Every month has 28 days. And to compensate so that their time doesn't keep shifting every year, every six years, they throw in an extra month. That <laughs> sounds crazy, but they throw in the month of Adar, which is their February, March month. Every six years, they add an extra month to keep it from getting it's completely out of balance as far as the time goes. But the first month of their religious year is the month of Nisan, and Passover happens on the 14th day of the first month, and then unleavened bread, which is their second feast day, happens the day after Passover, and it lasts for an entire week. The third feast is first fruits, which happens on the 16th day during the first week of unleavened bread. So on the first month, you have Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits. And what first fruits is, which is what is mentioned here, is it's a feast where, where the Jews offer God uh, a representative portion of the blessings that he has given them. And what would happen is this. In the first month of the year, the feast uh, or the, 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 the uh, harvest of barley comes in. Now, I'm not an expert farmer, and I'm not an Israeli farmer, and I'm not sure about barley, but barley in Israel evidently harvests in the month of March, April. So first fruits is when a Jewish person would go out into the barley harvest, out into the fields, and they would cut off one sheave of barley, and they would bring it back in, and they would hold this one sheaf of barley up before the Lord, and they would wave it like it called a wave offering. And this one sheaf would be a representation of the whole harvest. But it, it, it would just be one piece of fruit, and it would represent all of the fruit that's out here to be offered to the Lord, and it would be saying to everybody, God is responsible for the blessing of this harvest and we're offering this to God, and we're, and we're letting this one, one fruit represent all of the fruit. I mean, it, it's where the concept of tithing comes from. It's what it does. You know, when we give our tithe, that's not all of the money we make. That's just a portion of what we make. And we're basically saying by giving our tithe, all right, Lord, we acknowledge that you give us the ability to make, to have all that we have. So the whole crop is represented by only a small portion, and this portion is first fruits. So God says that these were redeemed among men, and they are first fruits to God and the Lamb. So this is not the complete harvest of everybody that's going to be saved, but it is representative of that. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So here they are. Um, like we were talking about, that from the time they come to the Lord, they are without fault. So in other words, they are not sinless, but they're blameless. Uh, they've, been, they've, they've been saved just like everybody else who is a sinner on the face of this earth. They've been sealed by God, and from the time they have been sealed, they have been forgiven by God, so they're no longer accountable. They're, not, they're blameless before God, just like we are. I mean, it, just because we've been redeemed, it doesn't mean that we've never sinned. It means that God has washed our sin by the blood of the Lamb, and even though we are not sinlessly perfect, we are blameless in the sight of God. And so here they are, and God says, all right, from the time that they've been sealed, we want you to know that... that uh, they have no deceit, for they're without fault before the throne of God. So God has, 
God has sealed them, and they're representative of God. All right, now, once you see the 144,000 standing with Jesus, here comes three angels. And these three angels are going to have a proclamation, each one. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. All right, so here comes an angel. And the angel b begins to speak to the people, and he begins to announce and, 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 sh and shout uh, to the people. Now, this is interesting because angels announce things. Angels uh, speak warnings to people. Uh, angels shout, but, but they almost never preach to people. But here comes a preaching angel, and this angel begins to preach a, what is called an everlasting gospel. Now, does he preach a gospel that's different from the gospel that we preached? Because people that are saved during tribulation are going to have to be saved believing the same thing we believe. And so here's what the angel preaches. The angel says, all right, first point is this, fear God. Uh, the Bible says that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So what does fear God mean? It means, all right, respect God. Um, recognize God's power. Um, um, understand that how you stand in the sight of God. Now, the Bible says that all of us have sinned, and we have all come short of the glory of God. So fear God would be, all right, represent, uh, I mean, uh, recognize where you are when you stand before God. So the reason we know we need to be saved is because we know we are sinners. So the angels preaching the message, all right, recognize that you're a sinner, respect God, and then give glory to God. To give glory to God means to accept the salvation that God offers. So for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and then Romans says that um, that and that uh, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So receive the salvation that God has offered you, and then um, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the seas and the springs forever. So recognize that you've sinned, give God glory, accept the salvation that God offers you, and then worship him. And genuine worship means that 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 I start living for God. In other words, my life begins to reflect that God has saved me, and that brings glory to God. How do I bring glory to God on earth? I, be, I bring glory to God by, by living out the life that God intends for me to live. And so the gospel, the everlasting gospel that the angels preach is the same gospel that we're saved by. Under, uh, reverence God, respect God, understand where you stand with God. Then open up your heart and receive what God has offered to you and then begin to live like God has called you to live and worship him and reflect what God has done on the inside of you. Walk the walk, talk the talk, and live the life. And so this angel begins to preach that, all right? Now, another angel, so here's a second angel following saying, Babylon is fallen is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, just mentioning here, we're going to see a lot about Babylon in chapter 16 and 17. Babylon is uh, the name of a place, and of course, in the Old Testament, Babylon was, was a city, and Babylon was an actual city that existed as a matter of fact, uh, it still exists. It's, a, it, it's, it's just a, a tiny remnant of, of its former self. Um, Babylon's an Iraqi place. It's not much of a city anymore, but it used to be a tremendous great city. But Babylon as a term, and you'll see it in chapter 16, 17, comes to represent a lifestyle or represent um, a way of living, it, and, it, and it pretty much describes the whole 
existence of the beast and the Antichrist. It, it, when, when it says that Babylon is fallen, it, 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 it really is talking about a whole society, a whole network of beliefs and culture and so forth. Not just a single city, but a whole way of living, a whole lifestyle. And so this angel says, all right, uh, at this point, because Jesus has come back and Jesus has uh, rescued Israel and Babylon has been destroyed, so the, 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 the kingdom of the, of the Antichrist and the, and the, uh, the, the nation of, of uh, or the, uh, the uh, concept of all that the beast stands for has been destroyed. The political and economic and religious thoughts of all of that have been destroyed by, by, the, by the Lamb. Then a third angel following them, saying with a loud boy, voice, says, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest or day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. So this angel is now proclaiming that um, eternal judgment uh, falls on all those who worship the Antichrist or his image or are receiving his mark. Uh, refusing the mark of the Antichrist will mean almost certain death, but receiving the mark of the Antichrist uh, not only secures your loss, but also secures you a place in hell is basically what he's saying. So here we have three angels basic, basically making proclamations that, the, that because Jesus has triumphed here over the beast and the Antichrist, and he's standing with his 144,000, that Babylon has fallen, and that all of those who have the mark of the beast now have, uh, are going to receive torture and punishment. They're going to be marked, and they're going to be they're going to have no rest. They're going to have torment and torture for the rest of their life, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever and ever, and they have uh, secured a place in hell. Yeah, for the rest of eternity. Right, that is just, that would be him. <laughs> yeah, in other words, you've secured your torment forever and ever uh, if you have received the mark of the beast. Yeah, and, and we've told, we're, we're told that if you get the mark, if you don't get the mark of the beast, you're, you're not going to be able to buy or sell or have any commerce or do anything during the, king, during the, during the last part of the tribulation, and you're going to be hunted on the Judean hills and chased like a dog. But if you do get the mark of the beast, God says you're sealing your own judgment, and you're, uh, you're going to be tormented and tortured forever and ever. You've secured your place in hell. And he begins to describe it, you know, in, in these in these really uh, tumultuous ways. Verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. From now on, yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So he's making a proclamation about um, the fact that those who have, those who have separated themselves for God uh, have received rewards and those who don't have secured their place in hell. So the picture is when Jesus stands on the Mount Zion, he, and, he, and, he, and he's won the battle, that all of these great things are going to happen, and these angels are going to begin proclaiming, and they're going to be warming, the, the 144,000 are going to be warming up to sing a song, and this is going to be a tremendous song because nobody can sing it because nobody's been through what they've been through. So they're going to be able to sing something that none of us can sing because uh, obviously we're not, we haven't experienced the, the things of, of the earth. Now, uh, a, a new picture, this is kind of an unusual picture of Jesus because we don't ever see Jesus looking like this, but this angel that is beginning to be talked about here or this one that has the sickle in his hand is, is Jesus. I know it, you know, we've never seen Jesus reaping a harvest on earth, but we're, we're about to see 
him stick a sickle into the earth. You know, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus is the sower of the seed. You know, the sower went forth to sow, sow, and he sowed good seed. And the good seed fell among tares, and the enemy had, or fell in the ground, and the enemy sowed tares among the wheat. And as the wheat grew, the tares grew with the wheat. And then the, 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 uh, the servants of the good, of the good, good uh, landowner comes to him and says, hey, you want us to, sit, you want us to get these wheats out of the tar- tares, out of the wheat? And then the good owner, the good, good man of the house said, uh, no, don't, don't let them go. Let them go. Uh, because um, if you try to pick out the tares, you're going to damage some of the wheat. In other words, um, and, and I, I don't mean to, to put words into it, but, uh, but it seems to me what he's saying is, all right, I don't want you to try to separate the good from the bad because you might, unfortunately, uh, damage some of the good because you really can't tell what's good and bad. And that's, that's really the truth, right? Because a lot of things that we might call bad ends up being good. And things that we might think are good to start with end up being bad. And, yeah. Right. That's exactly right, Rick. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. That a tear, and, and it's, uh, I, I think the, the, the uh, exact word for it is, is, is the term darnel. And darnel is a certain type of weed. But this weed looks exactly like wheat until, like Rick mentioned, until it matures. And when it matures, the, 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 the wheat has a nice pod and a nice white you know, pod, and the darnel, the weed, looks just like the wheat, but it doesn't have this nice pod on top, and that becomes the only difference. But the only time that you can really tell the difference, unless you're really an expert, uh, would be you got to let that thing ripen. And at the time of harvest, then the harvesters will know the difference. And Jesus said what they're going to do is they're going to gather the wheat and put it in the barn, and they're going to gather the weeds and they're going to put, bind them together, and they're going to cast them into the fire to be burned. Now, in Matthew 13, Jesus is seen as the sower of the seed. But now, here in Revelation 14, he's going to be the reaper of the harvest. So, in Matthew 13, when Jesus is talking about, let them grow together until the time of harvest, because at the time of the harvest, the reapers will know the difference. Uh, he's really talking about himself. Look at what it says. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hands a sharp sickle. So the angel says, all right, the Son of Man, he uses the word diadem here. Now, angels are not seen with diadems on their head. The only one in, he- one in heaven that's seen with diadems is, is Jesus, you know. Others have victor's crowns. You know, they have crowns like laurel wreaths, like an Olympic champion, because they have crowns that they've received for the works that they've done. But this angel, this one that he's describing here, John says, Hey, it looks like the Son of Man to me, and he's got a diadem on his hand. But, you know, this one has a sharp sickle in his hand, which is uh, uh, indicative of reaping something. And it goes on to say, And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And so he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So this is talking about a time of judgment. And it's talking about, I mean, this, this thrusting of the sickle is a, is, a, uh, is a spiritual thing, and it's separating people who, uh, who know the Lord from people that, that don't know the Lord. So this thrusting of the sickle is talking about the fact that when Jesus comes and he stands 
and he and he and he defeats the enemy on the Mount of Mount Zion, and he stands on Mount Zion, and the 144,000 are with him. That all of this activity is going to begin to sound, and the angels are going to come forth, and they're going to make their proclamations and say, uh, you know, these are the ones that have come out of tribulation, and they've been redeemed, and they they're they're pure and they're clean, and then, then the orchestra starts warming up, and they start preparing to sing their song, and then. Uh, the, 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 the angel starts saying, if you have the mark of the beast, you're going to be judged. And, it, you know, and, and, and so all of that begins to go on. And then here comes another angel out of the temple of God and says, all right, we're ready, we're ready. And the Son of Man begins to thrust his sickle in the earth and separate now uh, the righteous from the unrighteous. And he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sickle, sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth, and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. This is describing the, the events of the, of, the, uh, of the great battle that's going on and the fact that uh, when Jesus sets his foot on the earth that there's going to be a tremendous battle, and this battle is going to be, well, what we call the Battle of Armageddon, and that this battle is going to be a physical thing that happens on earth, and the ones that are going to be, that are going to be trampled, whose blood is going to be pressed out, uh, are going to be the ones that don't know the Lord, the ones that uh, the sharp sickle has uh, cut off and, and, and been found in judgment. I mean, it's like this. Uh, this is basically describing the events that are going to happen when Jesus comes back and steps his foot on the Mount of, of Zion and uh, judges the world of, of those who know him and those who love him and those who he's rescuing and those who are judged because they have the mark of the beast, because they fight on the army of the beast. And he's describing the events of, of Armageddon. And, of course, we understand that at Armageddon, the Lord's going to fight the battle, and the Scripture tells us when that battle is fought that the blood is going to run to the horse's bridles. And this right here is just saying, all right, uh, there are a couple of things you need to understand. One is that um, when, when the crops are harvested, that there is a certain aspect of the, of the, har of the crops being harvested, which is, are the grapes themselves. But once they're harvested, then they have to be thrown into the wine press. And the wine press separates, you know, and, 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 and pushes the blood out. And the blood is, is going to run as deep as the horse's bridle. So he's, he's really here just describing a, a religious event and a, uh, and a, and a, and a, and a, uh, and a judgment event where Jesus... Uh, steps down into the arena of Armageddon to trample down the Antichrist and those who gathered with him in his, in his final conquest. And this is a picture of Armageddon and the battles and the fightings and what's going to happen to those who fight against the, against the Lamb at that last moment of time. So he's just saying, all right, get ready, because here's what's going to begin happening. Now, this is not happening at the moment that he's speaking it, because we're right now about halfway through the tribulation period, but he's given us a picture of what's going to happen when we get to the end. So chapter 14 ends with uh, the Battle of Armageddon. Um, everything's happening uh, to prepare for it, and the angels are warming up, and the, and the, and the battles are warming up, and Jesus is ready to uh, judge, and, uh, and the Battle of Armageddon is going to happen, and uh, Jesus is going to conquer everyone, and he's gonna, the blood's going to run as deep as the horse's bridle for these 200 miles down through here, which is a tremendous valley, you know. That's a, imagine that, 200 miles long, you know. <laughs> Good night. Uh, deep as the horse's bridle, you know. I mean, 
mean, good night. I mean, this is a, that's, that's a tremendous battle. And so chapter uh, 14 ends with, with that kind of an understanding. And chapter 15 now um, is uh, where is, a, is, the, is the eighth picture. And the eighth picture, it says, then I saw another sign. So here's the last sign in this little middle section. It's the eighth sign. It's the sign. And he said, I looked into heaven, and, a, and, and a great and marvelous seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who had the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass having harps of God. So John said, all right, now, when I saw these last picture of, of, the, of, the, of the sharp sickle and Jesus ruling and pressing the blood and it running as deep as the horse's bridle, he said, I saw another sign in heaven. And what was going on in, in heaven is all of a sudden now we have seven angels. And these seven angels are going to be uh, given uh, some bowls. And in these bowls, they're going to be the plagues of God. And these, by the way, are going to be the last. This, these are going to be the bowls, the vials that are poured out on earth. And these vials, according to the passage, are filled with the wrath of God. So these are going to be the last things that begin to happen. And, and, and these bowls or plague are going to bring the Antichrist rule to, uh, to, to collapse. This is going to be the final straw that really breaks all of the bondage of the of the Antichrist. And so John's attention is focused, first of all, on this shimmering glass, this crystal glass or, or this around the throne of God, and it looks like it's on fire. So he's just trying to give us a picture of, uh, of a tremendous sea of glass and standing on the sea of glass, standing on this burning sea of glass is a group of people who are victorious over the Antichrist. And, and their victory... Um, is there because they've been uh, faithful to God. They remain faithful to God. And so they're ready and they're prepared. And it says that they begin, that they were standing on the sea of glass and they have harps. And here's what they do. They begin to sing. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. So there's, they start singing the song, and I, I wrote in your notes a couple of thoughts about the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And it's just interesting uh, that that it's, it's distinguished for us in the scripture that the words of these songs are words that have been sung in, in the scripture. And one of them, one of the songs or some of the words reflect the song of Moses, which would be the song that Israel would sing. And I, and I wrote in your note that many interpreters believe that the song of Moses is uh, found in Exodus 15, in verse 1 and 2, in verse 11, and if you read those verses, it, it, it talks about um, the, the, the greatness of God and the character of God exhibited by his defeating the enemies of Israel. So in this song, the words that reflect the greatness of God and the fact that God defeats enemies and God is faithful and God uh, is conquering and God defeats enemies and protects Israel and, uh, and, and has a wonderful uh, blessing for those who, who love him. And then the words of the Lamb or the song of the Lamb is the song of redemption, the song where you're saved, uh, you're washed in the blood, forgiven by uh, the blood of Jesus, washes you clean, you have been redeemed, and you don't face judgment because God has uh, saved you, and the sacrifice of Jesus has made all of this possible. And so words like, you know, uh, 
uh, and you shall fear, and, and, and uh, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and, and glorify your name, for you are holy, for all nations come, and they worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Those are the words of the Lamb. So they sing the song of Moses, and they sing the song of the Lamb. They've been warming up, and uh, the words that they sing reflect God's power, God's redemption, God's uh, victory over the enemy, and the awesomeness of God, and the holiness of God, and how God has redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. And so they're singing that uh, as they, as they stand on this crystal sea, after these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. And out of the temple came seven angels, having the seven plague, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. So here now come seven angels, and they're coming out of the temple of testimony. The temple of testimony is the temple uh, uh, that is in heaven that evidently the two temples on earth that have been described for us are duplicates or copies of the temple in heaven. In the Old Testament, there are two temples that are described. One of them is called the tabernacle, and the tabernacle was the, the tent in, it, in the Old Testament where God spoke to Moses on the mountain when he gave him the Ten Commandments. And he said, all right, I got, another, I got some more laws for you. I got some more commandments for you. And the whole book of Leviticus got translated to him where it describes all kind of rules like dietary laws and uh, laws for the priest and uh, uh, consecration laws and holy days and feast days. And then he said, now, I want you to build me a tabernacle. And this tabernacle is to be built just like I tell you to build it. And he says, now, don't waver from this and don't make up anything and do it exactly like I tell you. Every description, every inch, every every bit. I mean, do it just like I told you in the mountain. And so God has a temple in heaven, and, the, and that temple is the center of worship in heaven. And so the tabernacle in the wilderness is the exact duplicate of the temple that is in heaven. And it has an outer court, and it has an inner court, and it has an innermost court. It has a uh, an outside place where people can gather, and that's where the brazen altar is out here where sacrifices are made. So it's kind of a common place where uh, people can enter and, 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 and the blood can be offered on a, an altar out here, and these people can be redeemed because of the blood they offered. And then you go into a place where it's a, a, a more holy place, and everybody can't come in here only, only uh, the Jews could go in. The Gentiles could not go in that court. And then the innermost court was a place where only the priests could go in. It's called the Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies, they had the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was a box where inside the box were three things. One, the golden pot full of manna, which represents God's provision because God gave Israel manna in the wilderness. Of course, the golden pot didn't have any real manna in it, we know, because manna didn't last, you know. But the pot symbolized the fact that God had fed them in the wilderness. This was inside the, whole, inside the Ark of the Covenant and also was Aaron's rod. Aaron was the first high priest that God called. You know, Aaron was Moses' brother that God said, all right, Moses said, I can't talk. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I stutter around or I can't talk so good. And God said, all right, well, take your brother Aaron. He can talk. And it's funny that even though Moses took Aaron, there's no, there's no description of, of Aaron ever saying anything. <laughs> you know, even though he took Aaron with him, Moses did all the talking, you know. And God said, all right, I'm going to, you know, if you want to let Aaron talk, that's fine, but I'm going to hold you accountable for what he says. And so Moses does all the talking. But that rod that showed that Aaron was the high priest is inside the, the, the Ark of the Covenant. And you remember, this is the rod 
which proved that Aaron was God's man because the, everybody who said, all right, I'm the high priest, and then somebody other said, I'm the high priest, I'm the high, and God said, okay, here, here's how we're going to sell it. Get, get a rod that represents every family and put it over there, and the one that blooms and blossoms and has fruit on it, that's going to be proof that, I'm the, that they're the one I chose. And Aaron's rod had blossoms and had fruit on it all at the same time, and it proved that Aaron was the one that God had chosen. Well, that was in the Ark of the Covenant. And then the tablets that Moses brought down off the mountain, that when he got to the bottom of the mountain and saw all the sin going on in Israel, he threw them down and they broke into pieces, which, of course, represents the broken law and the law that Israel violated before God even got, even though the, before the covenants got down, the people had already violated, violated everything that was written in them, the Ten Commandments that God had written with his fingers. And, and Moses shatters them, and pe their pieces were picked up and put into the Ark of the Covenant. And then all of that, the manna, the Aaron's rod that budded, and the broken commandments were all covered with a three-and-a-half-inch solid slab of gold with a cherubim angel on each end with their wings stretched forward and almost touching in the middle. And this was called the mercy seat. So the mercy seat was placed over the broken law and the, and the commandments and, and, and Aaron's rod. And the mercy seat was where the priest came once a year with the blood from the altar out here that represented the sins of the people. And then the priest took the blood and he, and he sprinkled the blood right where the cherubim angel wings came together. I mean, they almost touched. And it was right there that the priest sprinkled the blood. And, and this is the unusual thing about this. Nowhere in the scripture is it described how they would clean this this mercy seat. I mean, you know, if you're going to drip blood, eventually you're going to have to clean that stinking nasty thing. I mean, really think about it. Blood, blood is being dripped. Yeah, stained it. And I mean, stinking and nasty because, I mean, eventually, you know, you'd get a little scale, you'd get a little buildup and it'd be, you know, and it's blood now. Yeah, nasty. And, and, but there's no, and everything about the tabernacle and the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant is described in the book of Leviticus and, and, uh, and, and Deuteronomy. And, and, and you would say, okay, there would be somewhere in there that would say, all right, when you clean the mercy seat, here's how you clean it. You know, you sanctify it and you cleanse it. But nothing is said about it. So the conclusion is, ooh, there's no, there's no blood that accumulated. It's, it's, it's as if when the priest dripped the blood, it just evaporated or, it, or God, God just sucked it in or whatever. In other words, there's not any. It just is gone. And so God said, this is the temple. And, and that tabernacle was an exact replica of the temple that is in heaven that's being described here right now. Now, when they got out of the wilderness, Solomon, remember David wanted to build a, king, build a temple. David, King David, was the one who rescued the Ark of the Covenant, which symbolized the presence of God and the power of God. Everywhere the ark went, the children of Israel went. The children of Israel were victorious. It was the ark of the covenant that was representative of the power of God. And the enemies of God recognized this. And remember the Philistines, all of the enemies of God really wanted to try to capture the ark of the covenant. And you remember at one, one time the Philistines stole the ark of the covenant. How they got to it is unbelievable. And, and, you know, just like, how in the world could you allow that to happen? But they stole it, and then they, they opened it. And when they, when they began to try to open it, uh, 18,000 of them were killed, just, <laughs> you know. Like, any of you, did you, all you guys see Raiders of the Lost Ark? 
You remember how when that German guy opened up the ark and all of a sudden the glory of God spewed out of that thing and he just began to melt, you know, <laughs> right there in the presence? I don't know if that's how it happened, but that's a good, that's a good representation, I think. And 18,000 of them were annihilated just for trying to open the ark, and then they got scared. And, then, and so what they did is they hooked the ark, they put it on a, they put it on a, on a little wagon, and they hooked the wagon to some milk cows, and they, and, they, and they pointed the milk cows toward Israel, and they, you know, and, they, and the milk cows started carrying the, the, pulling the wagon down the road, and when it got across the borderline, the Israelites got it, and they took it to a certain place, and you remember as it was going, they were trying to take it back to Jerusalem. And so they were saying, all right, we're going to take this, we're going to let it stay on this cart, and we're going to take this cart with these milk cows back to Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, which is where the ark needed to be so that David could set up a worship center so that the people would have the power of God and the presence of God back in Jerusalem and the blessing of God could be back in Jerusalem. And when they got to a certain wide spot in the road, the, 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 the little wagon hit a bump, hit a pothole. And when, it, and when it hit the pothole, the cart kiltered over like this and, 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 and one of the guys just reached up his arm to keep the ark from falling off the the little cart, and when he did, God struck him dead right there on the spot. And everybody got scared to death. It was like, oh, my Lord, you know, and they ran back from the ark, and nobody wanted to touch the ark, and it was like, oh, you know. And, and so uh, the people, the men with the ark said, hey, does anybody, does anybody want the ark? <laughs> what are we going to do with him? Yeah. And, and a little guy named Obed-Edom, Obed-Edom said, I'll take it. And so Obi takes the ark home with him. And the Bible says that God begins to bless Obed-Edom. You know why? Because God wanted everybody to see where the ark was, the blessing was. And so God began to bless Obed-Edom. And he got blessed so much that everybody noticed it. It was like, you know, Obi's crops. When everybody else didn't get any rain, his crops got all the rain it needed. When it came time for harvest, the rain stopped. And man, he just harvested way more than anybody else. Obi's children were more obedient than everybody else's. They were healthier. His wife was prettier. I mean, the people began to notice that because of the ark's presence in Obed-Edom's home, which for three months it happened like this. It may have been a while since I've read a story. It may have been for six months. But, but anyway, it was perfectly obvious that the, the ark brought the blessings. And so King David gets jealous because he hears how much Obed, Obed-Edom is prospering. And David said, and God did this to cause this jealousy because God wanted the ark in Jerusalem. And to get it there, David, the king's going to have to get it there. But he's not going to be able to put it on a cart with some milk cows pulling it because that's not how God said the ark gets carried. Ark said, but God says, when you carry the ark, here's what you do. You get the Levites. You get the priest. And you get some, and you stick these long staves through the ark, and, 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 you, and you lift it up by these staves, and you have Levites in the front and Levites in the back, and they're carrying this ark, and they, they have a sacrifice, and they take so many steps, and then they have another sacrifice, and they take so many steps, and they have another sacrifice, and they do that all the way back to Jerusalem. So it's a bloody mess because it's the blood of the innocent shed for the guilty that redemption is the picture of. And so when you carry the ark, you don't hook it to milk cows and put it on a cart. You carry it like God said to carry it, and that's the only way he'll bless. And so David sent the pre Levites out there, and they began to carry the ark. And as they began to get back to the city of Jerusalem, King David came out of the, out of the, out of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the kingly palace, and he got in front of the Ark of the Covenant when, he, when, it became, when it started to come through the gates of the city. And he started dancing around out there like a, like a jester clown, like a foolish person. And his wife, who was Saul's daughter, looked out of the window and said, 
Quit dancing like that. You look foolish, man. And David looked back and said, if you think I look like a fool now, I'm not even really prepared. Just wait till I get prepared. And he danced his way before the ark of God, showing that all men look foolish in the sight of God. And he took them to a place, and they set the ark up, and they had perpetual worship 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all around the ark of the covenant. Because there was no temple in Jerusalem. There was no place, there was no holy of holies to put the ark in. And so then David began to say to God, let me build the temple. And David thought he was going to get to build the temple of God. But God said, no, 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 you can't build the temple. I'm going to let your son do it. And so Solomon, David's son, builds the temple of God. That's the original temple, Solomon's temple. And Solomon's temple was an exact replica of the tabernacle in the wilderness with the same dimensions, the same exact design, the same everything. And God said, build it like I told you. Do not err from this. Do not duplicate anything. Don't take any shortcuts. Do it exactly like I said. And so the tabernacle in the wilderness is a reflection of God's temple in heaven. And the temple in Jerusalem that Solomon's built is an exact replica of the temple in heaven, the future temple that's going to be built in the city of Jerusalem where the mosque of Omar now sits. The Antichrist is going to give them the site and they're going to take it from the Arabs and the mosque of Omar is going to be torn down and God's, and the Jews are going to build Solomon's temple on the exact site. The reason the mosque of Omar is there is because the the, the Islamic people, the Arab people, also say that Solomon's temple is a holy site because, of course, they claim that they're children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so they, they, they think their heritage comes from that. And when they saw that Solomon's temple site was disrespected and not protected, this was you know, back years and years ago, then they said, all right, we're going to take that site and we're going to make it holy. And so they built their mosques there because they felt like that site had been neglected and disrespected. Now, even though they don't worship the Lord like we worship the Lord, they do claim that as a religious site and a holy site, which is going to be one of the reasons why the Antichrist gives it to the Jews because that'll surely convince them that he's their friend and that uh, he's going to be their man. And then he gives them the site, and then he gives them permission to tear down the mosque, and then they're going to tear it down. They're going to build Solomon's temple, or they're going to rebuild the temple of God. And just when they begin to get the, get the sacrifice ready to be sacrificed, the beast is going to come in the back door with a pig and put it on the altar down there, and the Jews are going to go, oh, my Lord, the abomination of desolation that Jesus talked about is there, so let's run for our lives. And sure enough, that's going to be the, the mark of that. But this is the tabernacle. And, and John says, And I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and out of the temple came the seven angels, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands, which means that they're not, they're, they're not unrestricted. The seven bands around their chest basically is talking about, okay, they're not acting out of their own desires. They are... They are uh, restricted, so to speak, with, with bands of gold around their chest. So, so they're not acting out of their own insight or their own desires. That They're controlled by uh, the things of God. So they're dispassionate about this. It's not like these angels are uh, like enjoying what they're doing or they're just saying, okay, let's give them the worst we got. Let's have a good time and all of this. No, this is not out of their own. They're almost dispassionate about what they're doing. It's like, we got a job to do. God sent us to do this job. We're going to do this, and this is not our thing. This is God's thing. Then one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels. You remember those four living creatures that we met back in chapter 4 that are flying around the throne? They had the four faces. You remember that? And the six wings, and they're flying around the throne going, holy, holy, holy. Well, all right, one of those guys and one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So this, this uh, one of the living creatures comes out and he says, all right, I got seven bowls here and he's, uh, I'm going to give you a bowl and you a bowl and you a bowl and you a bowl. So he starts handing them the bowls and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God. 
and from his power, and no one was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were complete. So when the, when, when the, when the living creature gives these angels these seven bowls that are filled with the wrath of God, the glory of God, which it says, and the smoke from the glory of God and from his power fill the temple. In other words, there, God, has, God has, a, has a presence that can be visible. And this visible presence of God is called the glory of God. The Shekinah, that's exactly right. The Shekinah, the word that's used is the Shekinah, which means nothing but the outward visible presence of God. So when the, when the glory of God can be seen, it is called the Shekinah glory. To give you an idea of when that was, you remember when God began to lead Israel through the wilderness, there were two things that, went, that he used to lead the children of Israel. The two things were the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And so everywhere the pillar of cloud went, the children of Israel went. And then at night, wherever the pillar of fire went, the children of Israel went. So the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire were the Shekinah glory, the visible glory of God. So in the temple now, this visible glory of God is so powerful that it, 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 it ignites in, in, inside the temple, and John describes it as being like a smoke that just fills the temple, and nobody, nobody can enter it. Nobody can, can violate it. Nobody can be in the presence of it. It's just like the glory of God is just unleashed out of the holy of holies that's in the temple of God in heaven, and nobody's going to be able to go in the temple until these vials are poured out, until these last plagues are poured out on earth. And so John says, all right, now we have the temple of God that is filled with the glory of God, and we have seven angels standing here, and these seven angels have plagues of God that he's going to begin to pour out on the earth, and these plagues are going to be dynamically filled with the wrath of God. And what they're going to do is they're going to begin to destroy the kingdom of the Antichrist, the... the the, the Babylon, the mystic Babylon, the, the structure, the economic, the religious, the political system that the Antichrist has set up on the earth are going to be, is going to be blown to smithereens by these seven plagues that are filled with the wrath of God. And nobody's going to get to go in and out of the temple in heaven until these plagues are filled. So the whole thing begins to start shaking apart. And next week, now we'll, we'll try to look at 16 and 17 next week, and then the next week, of course, will be the Sunday after uh, Thanksgiving. Are you guys, you guys want to meet on that Sunday? And we'll go. I'm going to try to cover it um, so we'll be able to move. We'll just decide later on. But next week will be 16 and 17, where Babylon, Mystery Babylon, is uh, described. And uh, it's, it's interesting how God describes that. And uh, yeah, right, exactly. I mean, is this, is this, is this amazing what God does? And John is, you know, he's trying to, he's, he's looking at it in heaven, and he's trying to describe it to us, and he's trying to say, man, it looks like this, and it, a sign that looked like that, and then I saw another sign that looked like this, and then I saw angels, and these angels were bringing these bowls. And they, I mean, he's sitting there trying to describe for us what happens as the kingdom of the Antichrist is set up, and then the, in, the kingdom of the Antichrist is taken down and destroyed, and what, what, what happens with those that are on the earth and how God fulfills his covenant with the Jews and how he protects his people that he's made a covenant with and how they're going to be redeemed at the end and, uh, you know, that they're going to have to be redeemed just like us. They're going to have to be saved just like us. There's not another way of salvation. It's not like, okay, we come to the Lord one way and then they come to the Lord another way. No, they're going to come just like we've come. It's just the fact that they're going to begin to see Christ for who he is during these things. This is when they're going to recognize, my goodness, how could we have been so blind? How could we have not seen that? And then they're going to come to him, and they're going to receive him, and they're going to believe him. But now it's only going to be a very small remnant because the, the Antichrist has killed all of them that he could. And um, 
So anyways, powerful time. Powerful time. Powerful time. Oh, exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's right. We believe God, the gospel. Right. So they were, they were actually right. safe in the same way by believing right. and trusting God. Right. And, and the, the animals and the blood and all that, that's just pointing to Jesus. Right. Right, exactly. Jesus, as just what you were saying, Rick, and I know people didn't hear it, but but uh, that's all right, no problem. No, I mean, y'all don't be afraid to ask a question or anything like that, because or make an observation. But uh, yeah, the, what Rick was saying is that uh, Old Testament people were saved. If they were saved, they're saved like us. Abraham, it says, and Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And Abraham was called the friend of God uh, because he believed. And they were saved, according to Hebrews 11, these, these, this hall of fame of faith, you know, where it names all these people that did all of these things. And it said, and them, having received the promise of a reward, were saved by looking forward to these things, just like we're saved by looking back to those things. They were saved because they believed that God promised them something that was coming to save their soul and rescue their life, just like we're saved by looking back at something that we're told happened back there, and by faith we believe it. See, it happened back there, and they were looking forward to it and believed it. We are looking back at it and believing it by faith, and so it's by the same belief that... Right. It's all about believing and trusting God. That's exactly what it is. And, yeah. You know, as Christians, we know that God does nothing without purpose. Right. There's That's right. Purpose. Even like when they opened up the box for the covenant of children. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, right. God could have just took it and put it where he wanted it. Right. But he wanted different people to step up, if that's why it was. Right. More people to witness, more people to actually see with their own eyes mm -hmm. what was happening. You know, right. Mm -hmm. But he didn't. He wanted us to make that choice. Right. And the same thing he did with David and different ones. Right. He let them make the choice to work for what's good and, and he let them, but he still let them make the choice. Right. In the same way with our salvation, though, it's there. We just have to make the choice. That's right. Yeah, so the choice has to be made regardless of when it is or what it is that brings has you. A purpose yeah. For everything, just like right. that. Kill an 18 dollar people. And then right. Yeah. If you're a Christian and you believe. That's right. That's you exactly right. Right. God has a purpose in everything. All the choices we're made, right. all of the directions that are made, all of the the events that happen that seem to be, you know, circumstantial or, you know, by happenstance. Or, you know, you, there's nothing like that. Right. Everything's intended by God to, to move. All right. <laughs>